Okay, so um, today I've got uh, Con Nicolakis, the Chief Investment Officer of uh, Statewide uh, Super uh, with us. Um, Con also um, um, is a regular uh, contributor into our investment committee. And we're gonna have a, a discussion really as Con and I do, we have discussions um, that don't necessarily have the great agendas, but we explore the world of, um, uh, of finance and markets for the last quarter and um, try to figure out where the world's heading to. So um, Con, welcome. Um, Good to be back, thanks time. Andrew. Um, Con, we know, uh, well, we know that um, in the last quarter to June 30, um, Australian, the Australian share market rose by about eight and a half percent. Listed property up about 10, uh, 10, 10 10.7, 10.5, which is really a function of it was really beaten down um, in that in that period coming out of March 2020. International shares globally, MSCI, yeah. uh, 9.3, and um, and hedged international MSCI uh, seven seven and a half um, cash Australian cash global cash doing nothing zero <laughs> um, and bonds if you if you say diversified fixed interest but, yeah but if you say bonds uh, government bonds one point one, let's say, and probably lucky to get to 1.1 because we saw what you and I talked about, I think a year ago, um, I've done a video, Deadly Dangerous Bonds. Um, I'm going to get Tony Tor, uh, who I think you probably know, yep. at First Centia. I think yep. he's Australia's biggest um, fixed manager. interest manager. Uh, he and I are going to talk bonds again, but as a simple mathematical rule, um, a one basis point movement in the interest in, in the interest rate reflects in a one basis point movement in the value of your asset. Um, and if you times that by your duration, so let's say seven years. one basis point, and uh, and negatively, so you're down you're down a basis point, and your duration's eight years. Um, well, you're down about 8%. And yep. that sort of gets into the territory of you ain't coming back. Um, yep. That's permanent loss material. Yep. So Tony and I are going to try and do something on that. Um, but but let's start in the world of fixed interest. Um, and let's, let's, as we do, career around the market. Um, but if we start with government bonds, any regression analysis that you do, um, would suggest that government bonds are in negative territory. Um, I think that my numbers are they've been in negative territory since 2016. But we, we have central banks that keep issuing it and um, people keep buying them. Well, not necessarily people, but institutions keep buying them. Thoughts? Uh, so there's no value in, in government bond yield curves today. So why would you hold uh, bonds? Oh, so who, who's buying bonds? Okay. Central banks are the main buyers of bonds today, right? So they're holding the yield curve down low because they can. They can use what they call QE or unconventional monetary policy. So you run a deficit with on your left hand in your pocket. On your right hand in your pocket, if you're an arm of government, your central bank can buy that debt. Uh, you do need a fiscal stimulus so that works. And that can suppress the bond yield down and you can have a very flat yield curve. That's across the board. That's US, Europe. UK, Japan, Australia. So but that's what we've seen play out predominantly since the GFC and more so since COVID. Today, there is no value in a yield curve. In the good old days, 2005, six, you could get between 5 and 7% on 10-year government bond rate. You could have inflation anywhere between 3 to 4%. And you are actually getting an incredible return today. It's one point, I haven't checked, but 1.15 on a 10-year bond rate. Okay, so what are we saying? I think going forward, the upside, downside yield curve, it's almost two to one. So let's say it falls 15, 20 points to 1%. It's equally just as likely to go up 30, 40 basis points. So I think there's no return 
left. There's no juice in the yield curve and it doesn't represent good value. We hold some for diversification purposes, but when I say some say in the my super, it's literally like what 3%, 2%. The rest is credit, asset backed securities, floating rate notes, where we're trying to just do better because we don't like this yield curve. Yeah, so we're doing, we, we do a similar sort of thing. We've, we've got, um, as you know, and, and you're in the same boat, uh, we run uh, an investment in the Ardea uh, Real Outcomes Fund because those yeah. guys, they've got the, if you like, the, the government security, but they're playing the, um, the swap curve. Now, yeah. of course, their challenge is they need volatility. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's it, it's not a that's not a one way street either, but it's a better street to be in than holding long bonds with duration risk. Oh, absolutely. So fixed income RV, so we call that relative value. So so basically, it doesn't look at direction; it just looks at spreads between various tenors and various parts of the yield curve and plays it around. Absolute return strategies: fixed income RV, some macro stuff, some low equity, long short, low beta, and some credit. That's really where the funding positions out of traditional fixed income are coming. Now, I'm not saying and you looked at the June quarter, but everything's happened since June around the world. Let's be honest. But the, the, let's take June quarter. We've had yield curves rally again. So rates have been falling. And they've fallen again post-June because of Delta. But there's no value in the medium to long term. You are basically locked into a really a negative real return, particularly as inflation is threatening to bubble up. And we'll talk a bit about inflation later. So I don't see any value in government bonds other than holding some for diversification. If you don't, then don't have them move out to other parts like a day or like credit. Yeah, I, I mean, the, 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 guys, the, the guys in long bonds... Um, they're sort of the yield curves bu bumping along the bottom there, and um, they get hit, uh, but then you know, sort of it legs down, and oh, they're all right for a while, but in the end, you're pushing against the ground, so um, you know, um, it's the danger, the danger remains, and a lot of people don't understand the danger, is my suspicion. But let, let, let's just say this, Andrew. I think a very long duration 30 year bond trades like an equity. A 30 year bond is equivalent to these really expensive loss making growth companies that are listed that have gone up. So a Tesla, a 30 year government bond, these are similar strategies. In other words, they thrive on low interest rates, but they fund the fundamentals are not there long term. And that, that, that's actually the same strategy. And so if you do have long bonds in your portfolio, don't have these expensive high growth stocks in your portfolio. It's actually the same position. Yeah, you, you, but intrinsically uh, for advisors, uh, they have the, you know, the Teslas and what have you, Netflix, because they... Every fund manager has an exposure to those because they can all run around and say, oh, look how well we're doing. So as you said, one is correlated basically perfectly to the other. So when, when the inevitable happens, um, uh, the result will be uh, clear as day. Um, and, and that's why we, we, we don't run um, a lot of long duration bonds, but we do run, we run the credit um, and uh, and uh, once again, I think you guys are in the same boat. Um, we, we've got uh, Bentham. Um, yeah. We've also got syndicated loans through Bentham, probably where yep. there's more value. Yeah. So yield. Those strategies like the high yield or the opportunity, yield opportunities fund and syndicated loan fund, you know, even though the spreads have been crunched, but they're going to do a lot better than fixed income. I, I, look, when I look at what's happened in June, June was... Everything's changed since June, I reckon, around the world. And, and what, what, are the, what are the things that we're looking at? We do think if we just get through the current short-term situation with Delta and COVID and lockdowns that Australia and, and increasingly other parts of the world are experiencing, once you get through that, the, the themes that we're looking at, we are seeing 
higher inflation, therefore higher interest rates. We are worried about geopolitical risk, particularly in South China. That's now maybe being played out with what's happening in Afghanistan. Um, how governments react to policy in terms of lockdown, more fiscal, lower interest rates, but oil prices are up, inflation seeping up. And so geopolitical issues one side, slight inflation pressures on the other side, counteracting that is the current short-term pothole with COVID. The portfolio, you have to start thinking medium term and looking through the longer term how you want to be positioned. In the short term, as any other time, but more so this period, it's going to be very noisy around COVID cases, Delta, and how governments respond. Clearly, we need a vaccination rollout. We need to get the economy normalised around the world. And we need the Northern Hemisphere winter to be a good one. And I suspect they're already rolling out booster shots, but we need to get to some sense of normality to see the economies coming back because the, the current structure and the play isn't sustainable throughout the world, whether it's Australia or around the world. And what does it mean for markets? And I just think for markets, rates stay really low, but you don't want to be there. Some expensive stocks keep going higher, but you don't want to go there. You're going to have to, you're forced to go longer term. Think for the next five years, not the next three months, how you want to structure your portfolio. Yeah, correct. You know, the, um, the, the, the Delta, you know, the, the, the Delta situation in Australia is because of the low vaccination rate, it's going to keep the biggest, you know, New South Wales is 33% or plus of the economy um, and it's in lockdown. Um, they have to find a way out of that. Um, you know, the, the counter is, if you like, our friends in the Republican states in the US who um, are probably degenerating the Republican base because they're not vaccinated and they're dying. Um, um, you know, so there has to be a normalisation. I, I think the normalisation is a long way out. I don't think that... Uh, I. I COVID is not going away. So those people who in 2020 said, right, oh, it's 2021, we'll all move on. That's not happening. And it's not going to happen in 2022 either. So it has to be a straight strategy of live with and contain. Um, then, and, and that inherently has inflationary uh, in the bottom of it, if you like, because um, no longer, uh, the countries are just not going to be outsource. And, you know, part of the Australian uh, experience here is that for years we've deindustrialized and we've globalized and all of this, and we've got expect. You know, we've gone from the cheapest, cheapest creator of energy in the world to the most expensive in the OECD, and we can't produce. You know, Pfizer, mRNA, Moderna, whatever you want to call it. We, you know, and if it wasn't for CSL. Uh, we'd be cooking it up on our own stove. Well, put, put it this way. I do think the structural trends from COVID into onshoring, manufacturing, and key strategic industries, that was going to happen even without COVID, but more so now with COVID. Let, let me give you a good example. South China Sea. This is an area I've been focusing on a lot recently. There are definitely geopolitical tensions playing out between China and, and the US, China and Australia and lots uh, large parts of the world. I was in Darwin about four or five weeks ago and, and you can see the games being played up there between US Navy, Aussie Navy, US Air Force, Aussie Air Force. Now, what does it mean? It manifests its way in a couple of things. We are already seeing trade tensions. So that's been playing out since the Trump years, but it's still continuing. So trade wars are one thing. You've seen cyber wars, hacking cyber war, cyber securities between the various actors and the sort of state actors playing out. Third one's a tough one. That's geo, if it gets to geopolitical, geographical over islands in the South China Sea. But there's one thing in the South China Sea that's really important to the world. It's called chips. So in Taiwan and, and in South Korea, but probably Taiwan, it's the capital of computer chips. Chips are the new data, new oil around the world. So your car, your house, your phone, 
everything is relying on chips and it's predominantly supplied by TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor and the Taiwanese foundries. You're seeing onshoring of that, right? You're seeing shipping rates going through the roof and you're seeing onshoring. And you're gonna see that in Australia, you're gonna see in the US, you see a lot part of the world. So a lot of the stuff that's now strategic is coming back and that gets to your point. That is somewhat inflationary and probably the biggest theme in the next couple of years. And again, you're right about COVID. Let's not think about 221, but let's think about 222, 223. 223 onwards, there is an, a slight inflationary bias in the world with excess stimulus, no immigration, low interest rates, onshoring. All things being equal, inflation bubbles up, not ruinous, but it goes higher. Therefore, interest rates go higher. And how does your portfolio can succumb to that year three to five, not one month to six months, the next six months? Because the next six months is going to be noisy with COVID. We just have to accept that. That's my earlier point. So you're dead right. We are going to, we're moving into a new part of the cycle. We may have seen the famous new lows in bonds and rates. Again, famous last words. As rates go higher, what do you want to be owning? Probably want to be in materials. You want to be in commodities. You want to be in businesses that can pass on costs and not get their margins crunch. Maybe some key infrastructure, defense contractors, basic commodities, food is important. This type of stuff should do really well in your portfolio. And perhaps even industrials will, will come back that have been out of favor. Yeah, the insourcing, the insourcing of um, manufacturing of uh, computer chips is, and semiconductors is really interesting. If you have a look at um, what's just happened in uh, with Taiwan Semi, you know, um, Apple have said they're going, they're not going to use Intel chips. They're going to use their own chips. Uh, they were going to be manufactured by uh, Taiwan Semi. Um, Intel's gone in and bought the whole capacity, excess capacity of Taiwan Semis. Uh, so, so it, 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 if you like, it, it, there's two reasons it's done it. Uh, one is which is to jam um, um, Apple, but the second is uh, because it has demand and it has a new chip coming online. So that's going to drive, you know, there's going to be a lot of cactuses being moved in Arizona. It's a lot. You can't move an industrial plant like that. Correct. So, and and this, this has lead lag effects and hence why secondhand car prices are really expensive because you can't get a car, certain cars you just can't get, right? Some of these car companies that are listed in Australia are now having like the best ever periods and you can see their, their returns from Eagers and Peter Warren and all of that stuff. Yep. You, you, there's just effects coming through and it'll start to seep into the economy. You know, the other thing I did mention about the other thing that's happened really since June as well, and we saw it in July, is also the Chinese government is going after some of these highly profitable dominant industries. It could be the gaming companies, some of the tech companies, and definitely the educational companies. Yeah. That, at the margin is going to scare capital out of China. Great. China, China doesn't need, it's got its own capital. But what that does is ultimately lower longer term valuations for Chinese stocks. Because you know, in Australia or in the UK and the US, we can buy and sell you can vote boards, you can do things. But if you have governance issues in countries or in industries, the ultimate effect of that is you lower the terminal peak valuation. Agreed. And, and in our conversation, in our conversations that we have in the investment committee and outside, you know what my view is there that, you know, the, the story sold by fund managers for years has been that China and what have you uh, represent great value um, and great opportunity. And there's no doubt about that. It's a growing economy and what's happened up in China is phenomenal. But it is, it has always had the risk, frontier economies always have the risk of being the Hotel California. You know, you can check in, but you can never leave. And, and, and what we're seeing with a government, you know, the, the pursuit of people like Jack Ma and Tencent and, and what have you, that 
that causes a rewrite in people's thinking. And as you said, the Chinese yeah, don't need their and, money, and furthermore, but we need their return. Yeah, and furthermore, I, I do think that it's a stock pick as much. It's a terrible term. But if you're going to invest in, in emerging markets, it really finding skilled managers because they have to turn on a dime and they have to find companies where the government or management or society are aligned. There are companies that do that. It's food companies, there's, you know, there's the produce, it's sort of the industrial stuff. And, but there are companies that are sort of on the edge and they will get picked up by the government if they've got excess profit margins or if they're, if they're seen to not doing the social goal. And the Chinese educational companies were a good example of that. Maybe the gaming companies could be an example of that. And so, you know, you will have to accept a lower valuation. Even though the spread's there to the US, it'll never get come in because you can't have that clear, consistent governance that you have in, say, other countries of the world. So we, we think about that a lot. And so, you know, don't like bonds, like value shares, certain types of in, uh, in credit, uh, clearly some of the infrastructure stuff that looks interesting. But even that now is being gamed away. We can get access to statewide to unlisted infrastructure so we find good opportunities. But on the listed market, you know, the, 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 you're starting to pay away pretty expensive multiples for that. And so, you know, you know, the yeah, airport... You see, bit, you're seeing, like, uh, Sydney Airport. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I can tell you how many planes land at Sydney Airport. I've just got to look out the window. <laughs> and, it's, and, you know, it, I, I used to wake up at uh, just before 6 o'clock. It was Qantas Flight 8 uh, from uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, and um, I, I, I can sleep till 10 o'clock in the morning now if I want. There's, no, there, there's nothing going, you know, there's about four planes a day. Yet... In, uh, unlisted investors have decided um, that what they should do is pay a price that is really the value of a normalised airport. And um, so in, they are inherently paying too much based on today's flows, obviously betting that Sydney Airport yeah. will reopen. I think the plays, Andrew... For those who have a long enough mindset of the are the opening up rates, the reflationary opening up of the economy that will happen. But like you said, at 220, we said 221. We're sitting at 221, and we've all said this year is definitely a write-off. It's 222. So it's sometime between 222 to 223. Now, what's interesting is we have two live experiments going on around the world. One is the UK. Well, three, there's the US between red and blue states, there's the UK and there's Sweden. And we just want to see how that plays out. Because if you're like me and watch the English Premier League, you see um, oh, 75,000 people at a soccer game. Yep. So yep. things are opening up. They're moving to some sort of vaccine passports. I don't know. But watching how this plays out in the next couple of months, is really important. And you're right. We won't have an idea of how the world and policymakers... So it's one thing to have COVID. It, it may be you and I have a view on how to fix COVID, but you, what's more important is to say how policymakers respond to COVID. That's the, more, that's the most important thing. And you're right. Australia is predominantly shut down to Christmas or, so, or just before that. Northern Hemisphere will be tested over their winter. We get to March, April next year, we'll see how well the world's placed. Markets will discount that much earlier. So if they think the world's coming in a, in a good place, you'll start to see the opening up trades and all that coming on board later this year. Between yeah. now and later this year, it's going to be noisy. I agree. And, and, and those guys who have got into the opening up trade, if you like, early... Um, they're, they're, they're suffering some pain. I'm not saying they won't be fine in the long term, but there was a view globally that, you know, well, we, we started this pandemic with, oh, it'll be gone in six months, you know. Um, oh, it'll be gone in a year. We're now in two years. And um, so those guys who went on the opening trade early, um, they're sort of a bit stagnant. Um, they are. They are, and, and, and it may go on a lot longer, right? And we're going to really have to wait and see how this plays. And then, Pro, 
from an Australian perspective, it's clear you can't have the two biggest cities shut down. It's going to impact the economy. So when you were shut down eight weeks ago, we think, oh, God, if you can get to September, we'll be, I'll be happy. You've just said, well, it's not till November. So we are pretty much walking into uh, a technical recession, which is two quarters of negative growth. I agree. Highly likely we'll get a September, no doubt. There's an election early next year. So you always think about the circles when you manage money. Um, policy, economics, markets, the three circles. There's a fourth circle, health, right? So how those circles intermix. I suspect there'll be some sort of stimulus package announced for Australia, whether it's um, go hard, go early, go cash, households. I reckon around September, October, the reason they'll do that leading up to Christmas so people can spend some money as they come out of this and try and avoid a double dip because they're going to want to elect next year and they won't want to have that on the books. They have to, they have to, like, and you, you, you and I know this well, but in the global financial crisis, Kevin's financial crisis, uh, we... Um, what we saw was stimulus of money to banks. And we saw that in North America and Europe. Yep. And it didn't work because the banks got given the money, sat on the, put it on the balance sheet and said, aren't we wonderful? This time, central bankers have used effectively helicopter money. Um, we put it in people's bank accounts and what have you. That's not getting away from... Oh, that has been hugely stimulatory and it's giving us inflation and the central banks want inflation. But the guy it's not solving for, and there is a lot of damage being done here, you know, if you go down to your local neighbourhood and start walking the shops, and I don't know what it's like in Adelaide, but I can tell you walking around towns in New South Wales, you're seeing 16, 20, 25 shops closed. And oh, people great. think, oh, it's the milk bar. Well, it's actually not. Some of them have had big brands on the front. Um, and... Those put, you know, usually what happens in an economic downturn is that people like you and I get sacked instantly, got to save some wages, the finance guys get it in the neck, and everyone else sort of goes around and says, oh, well, this is going all right and what have you. This time, the poor old milk bar operator, um, and it has significant social uh, dislocation on it because the banks have forced these people to borrow against their houses. Their businesses are destroyed through no fault of their own. Um, so the, it's the government bad. is going to have to go big and go, go it, hard it's, again. It's grim. It's grim for small business. It's grim for family-run businesses. That's why I think there'll be a stimulus package. They have to have one, to be perfectly frank. to Because um, if you keep people in lockdown you're going to have to keep their businesses online. You're going to have to keep them alive, right? You can't, you, they need some sort of support. So, so that's, that's probably the biggest short-term hit that the market will have to digest soon. Um, and I think the government, hopefully the government, state governments have done as much as they can. It really is the federal government steps in and offers the support. So that's, that's it. Now, where do we go after that? You're, you're dead right. We get to Christmas, New Year. How does the Australian economy look like? It's got to open. It's got to open. It's going to open. Hopefully, you know, it started off doing less than a million vaccines a week. It's up to, it'll get to two million, over two and a half million. That means Sydney will be the first one through necessity, probably around 70%. And then the experiment starts. Now, what have we seen around the world? We see bad stats everywhere. 70% is a number for double vax, not single vax, right? Yep. I'm a statistician by background. I look at numbers and what they mean. You need 70% double vax, not single vax. No one around the world's really at that level. You know, Israel is the closest. Remember, even if you're 60% and those who are vax get 10% of the virus and those that aren't vax, that's still a big number. So if you look at places like Israel, they're, they're locking down, they're going for the third booster shot straight away. US is already organizing the third booster shot. Someone like me has had two shots already. No doubt sometime in the next nine months, I'll have the third shot. All things add up to what you just said. 220s are right off, 221s are right off. And it looks like 
a good part, a good chunk of 222. Yeah, and I was going to say a bit earlier as we discussed this gloom and doom, if you have a look at like the shipping rates out of, like you have a look at Prologis, the, the big US uh, shed operator, logistics operator, their sites are full. You look at the port of Los Angeles, there's stuff sitting just off the port at San Pedro. They can't get it shipped. There's boxes being returned to China and, and to Asia like it's going out of style. You've got a total dislocation of supply chain. And yeah. as you said, you can't build a semiconductor manufacturing plant in Melbourne or Arizona or anywhere in the world like that. It takes so you've time. deindustrialized all those places. Now you've got to bring it back. There's only one thing that happens then. It's going to cost more money. Yeah. Now, this gets to the market. So we've just painted a pretty dire scenario. So 220 was tough. 221 yep. proven to be tough, maybe 222. And so hang on, why are markets continuing to do well? Well, we just nailed it. Rates will stay ultra low. There'll be fiscal support. So if you think, what is a fiscal support? If the government runs a deficit, state and federal governments around the world run deficit, that money goes into the community. So it goes into the private sector. That private sector gets money. Hopefully the money starts to circulate. You get a multiplier effect. And the economy just, you know, hangs in there and bubbles along. Markets being what they are, are discounting out into the future. And if they're, they're starting to say, okay, I know this is a terrible time. But if I think we get back to some sense of opening up at around 222, then you'll start to see markets respond to that. And you're seeing some weird behaviour. Oil was negative. You couldn't give oil away a year ago. Today, everybody wants oil. What's that? Well, planes are flying again. People are driving cars. Folks are afraid to take public transport, so they're taking their cars. They're all buying second-hand cars to drive around because that's, right? And that's not an Australian phenomenon. That's a global phenomenon, right? Correct. So, 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 so there's demand there. You just have to pick the areas where the demand is. This comes back to you and your financial advisors. What does that mean? Stay diversified. Don't try and get too smart on this. Try to think a bit longer term, not shorter term. Try not to react to, we've had today, I don't know, over 600 cases in, in Sydney, or 633. Try and try to look out further and go, how can I position the portfolio for clients so they can start to benefit from some of the themes coming through? Agree. Agree, absolutely. Um, you know, um, our, our, our guys at Adansonia made the point when it was really grim uh, back in 2020, that the British stock market had fab fabulous days in the days after the Battle of Britain. Yeah. Uh, be because investors looked at, um, and investors looked and, and, and said, well, if that's the worst it can be, then if you look out, and they had a longer term view than we've got. We, we, we now are, are driven by, you know, what's on the, what's on the wires and what's happening, and we, we go into this panic and we need to build proper asset allocations and we need to look through, out through 2022 um, and, 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 and take a long-term view. And we need to not be getting involved in a lot of ridiculously priced businesses that are- Exactly. And you see on. that, particularly in some of the tech areas or the innovation. The other thing I'll say, the one thing that I do have slight concerns and just speaking to people and like even earlier when we had a chat, whether it's Sydney or Melbourne, what is the risk appetite for the community and what are the animal spirits coming out of this? I have no doubt that people have been really affected by this. In large parts of the Western suburbs in Sydney, people locked down in Melbourne for, I don't know, seven or eight times. People have genuine fear. So when we have meetings with our, our managers who are in Sydney and Melbourne, um, uh, and all of that, you, you can just you can just say that they're a little bit more on edge than this time last year, because everyone thought by this time, this time last year, everyone thought by September, two twenty one, we'd be all be out and about, we'd all be in Sydney having a beer and life's back to normal. It's clearly, if anything's got worse, not better. 
And so by the time people come out of this, they've been locked up for a while. It does take a little bit of risk appetite and animal spirits. Mm. I'm going to take a contrary view. I think when they do get out, they're going to go wild. They want yeah, to have I, a I, I, I know you have that view because we've discussed it on these before. Yeah. But yeah. And, and I tend to agree. It, it'll look like, if you like, the 1920s or... Yeah, yeah. I, and I use that mental model. We had a terrible The Great War. Then we had the Spanish flu who killed just as many people as the Great War. And then everyone just wanted to have a good time. They just got sick and cooped up. So the, the boomers, the Gen Xs, the Ys, the millennials, all of those have been cooped up. There are going to be some issues, right, to getting them back out because they've been just conditioned. But once they get the taste of that, they want to go out. They want to go on their trip. They want to go back to see their friends and family. They want to go travel overseas. And you will get, it'll feel like a boom when it comes out because they're literally going to be running out of the gate. It, well, the other thing to add back into that calculation is there is an inherent improvement in many industries of capacity, which is deflationary. Right, so people aren't travelling an hour and a half to work um, and an hour and a half back. They're now working from home, so that's going to change as well. And indeed, you, you're on this call working from home, not because you had to, but because you started the day probably uh, talking to fund managers offshore. Then yeah. we're doing this. In the past, you would have you would have gone to work, so. The, we've got more time back, which is deflationary. Um, we've got people who don't have to work um, in the CBDs anymore all the time, which is going to be interesting because you're seeing some of the big US banks, um, uh, Goldman's and what have you, saying, oh, well, if you want to be paid New York salaries, you'll have to come back uh, to, to New York. Uh, you can't work from, let's say, Denver anymore. Um, and then you're seeing some of the competitors like Barclays saying, you can work for, as long as you do a good job, I don't care where you work for. So you're going to see that push and shove. I have a view on this. Um, I, and I sound old school here. In the business I'm in, in the business you're in, you need to be in an office at least more than a couple of days with people where you're being trained or you're training or you're running experiments or you're bouncing research ideas. And you can do a lot online, but nothing beats the accidental interactive discussions. And I, so I, I don't disagree with that. And, and I think one of the big issues that business is going to have. So I think if you look at commercial property and you look at offices in CBDs, or let's just narrow it up, that office space is going to look different. When you and I started working, everyone had an office. They knocked down the offices. They built workstations. Yep. They knocked down the workstations. They eventually got to hot desking. Like you put a line straight through hot desking because I'm not going to sit at that desk after the last bloke who's got COVID, right? Yeah. But people are going to – you can't train – like – you can't train the next generation down a down a Zoom line or a Google line or whatever you want to call it. So that's where that's where businesses that inherently train lots of people, being the big banks and what have you, it's not sustainable. So they're going to have to redesign their office space, um, and they're going to have to bring people back. And Shane Elliott at ANZ, you know he. He said, I think it was, I'm going to work from home two days a week and three days in the office. Well, that's a fundamental change, but it's not the, he'll never go back to the office. No, exactly. So we'll see flexible. It's the two and three or the one and four. Then interesting, you look at the big banks and you look at Goldman's, JP's, you just mentioned ANZ. It's probably two days, but it's three days in. And then it's managing that. And so, you know, at Statewide, we do one day right? One and four. Um, um, but, you know, even when the staff was away, you know, on, on if they wanted to come back to the investment team because they want to be in an office, they want to have meetings, they were Zoomed out, right? Now, Adelaide's probably, you know, the, the getting to Adelaide and commute is a lot easier to say Sydney. So if you are out, in, you know, 
further out, you've got to commute one hour. You probably don't mind this. But we'll move to a hybrid model, and that's probably worldwide. But the edge will be those who can do the hybrid, not exclusively work from home, right? And I don't think we'll ever move for a long time to exclusively in the office. Mm -hmm. At the margin, there'll be more office than home, though. I do believe that. And, and speaking to managers and companies that we've invested in, that's the intent, right? They need their people. They need their set their culture. They need to run processes. They need to train people. The spontaneity of it. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I, I, I think it'll be interesting for Sydney and Melbourne in particular, as you know, like in Europe and and North America. Often these big companies have campuses out of town. You know the the most obvious ones are the big tech guys and Nike and what have you. And we we have tended to huddle all around one street. Um, we do it well. We huddle around Circular Quay in Sydney, and we huddle around Collins Street in Melbourne. And you do wonder whether over time, and it, it, it won't be three years time, that whether we'll start to move to the campus style. And, and we do have a degree of it in Sydney, Melbourne, and the Melbourne one really hasn't worked down the end of Collins Street. Um, but whether we do see people move further out, um, one of the things that there is no doubt about, um, and I don't think it's reversible, and it for office workers, I think we're, we're, we're ahead and, you know, what we're saying is basically the same. Certainly the occupation or the, the uh, there are a large number of people who have moved to the regions outside, if you like, what we do, and that is not changing. And no, it's it, it, what, what probably the biggest thing is the infrastructure. Yes. Uh, how do you access people, culture, information, and, and that's what will, uh, like last year, I, I lived in, the, in New York for a couple of years and everyone was calling for the death in New York. Well, they all went back. They actually miss New York. So they're, they're, so New York is, you know, doing well again, even though the cases there, again, are, are rising. And so I do think Sydney bounces back or Melbourne because people want to get back and, and just do things. But it'll be a change environment. The one thing, though, bringing it back to, to the portfolio, the one area that has played out well and I think has a limited capacity to run is housing. So, you know, you look at what housing's done, maybe regionally, but, but definitely in the major cities, the, the, the run-up in house prices is now, you know, house prices in Sydney are now globally expensive. They're not, you know, there was a time where everyone used to say in the 90s, well, Sydney house prices would go up to catch up with the big global cities, and we used to laugh at that. Well, now, that, that, they're actually more expensive than some of the global cities. And okay, so when Andrew Meekin and Colin Galakas borrowed for their first house, okay, rates were seven, eight percent higher, right? And you borrowed three times your income. Now the kids are borrowing seven or eight times their income at record rates. They are two or three percent off a severe margin call on paying loans and what happens to house prices and asset prices. And we're not saying rates go up by 3%, but in the next four or five years, the short-term rates go up by 2%, right? The famous last call, we're not Japan, right? The world is not Japan. We're not Europe or Japan. The US, Australia, and the UK have got enough levers that rates go up. The next couple of years, especially if inflation sits at two or three, we get 2% interest rates or two or 3%. Um, interest rate rises, I've said, to 225. If you've borrowed a lot of money, unless your wage has gone up, or you've made a ton of money, or you've improved your lot, and you've gone up the corporate ladder, or you've expanded, you're going to be paying a lot more in interest rates. That's going to curb your discretionary spend. I, um, the, the Australian housing market process, policy, whatever you want to call it, uh, is, in my view, insane. The, 
I'm going to make a call. It's peaking to Pete. And it's going to be the biggest holding back of future economic growth where people are trapped in high debt to get into a house, right? Okay. One of the attractions of the regions is because it's a lot lower. But then if you need to get back to home base, you're going to have to travel. If you're going to travel, we're going to travel. You're going to take a bus. You're going to take a plane. Or you're going to take a car. All right, let's get back to basic commodities. That's going up. Uh, because they're okay. trapped. I agree. Okay. You know, the, the people will be debt trapped. Um, and, you know, usually uh, I, I've said this a hundred times, I'll say it again. What does Australia do? Uh, we ship rocks, uh, we provide accommodation, be it hotel nights for tourists or houses which we sell off to foreigners. Um, and I know that there's a whole lot of conservative commentators who bemoan inbound uh, money coming from North Asia, which is fundamentally stopped at the moment. Um, and, and, you know, you're seeing property developers, uh, you know, the apartment guys, they're struggling. Um, no, in fact, I think it's Pete. I, I genuinely, and, and also, don't forget, the university is also struggling. I mean, they run a pretty interesting model where they basically get lots of people from overseas to come here and they charge them a lot of money and they also spend a lot of money here and therefore the, the Australian economy does really well while they go to university. Uh, that model's been severely disrupted and it's not coming back soon, right? No. Let's call that 224, 223, maybe 224. And it's not put back in a rush. So it's a, certainly a 224, and I think it might be further out. And I think it might be further out because if you're a kid offshore and you're thinking about where you might go to college, you can enrol in Arizona now or at Oxford now. You don't know that you can cross the Australian border anytime soon. Yeah. So the, the onus of proof will be on Australia to allow that and without quarantine and what what we've got so assuming covid goes away assuming the geopolitical tensions between china and the rest of the world which i think the second one tensions go higher the two-way traffic between australia and china in terms of people movement is going to be a lot harder uh could be harder in the us and canada as well maybe a bit easier in the uk but it depends on the hong kong situation so we've got lots of really big themes that are going to impact, and which is why I get back to diversification, having credit, having equities, having infrastructure, having property, and having that in weightings proportional to your risk tolerance or your age is really important. So I think the advisor of the next five to 10 years is almost a mentor, coach, and shrink as much as they're an investor managing the variances because the run's been so good for the last, say, 15 to 20 years. I do think the next 10 years we're in a period of more volatility and a lot lower returns. And managing that is going to be a lot of, you know, just guiding people through this and so they don't make silly decisions. Well, in fact, and we might, we might, we might finish up with two comments. Um, one of the things that I do every day um, is I talk to people who want to talk about past performance. Now, the thing about past, and, and, and as an industry, um, there is a whole lot of behaviour that it involves not looking forward, but talking about the past and selling past performance. Now, in FASIA, in the FASIA standards, FASIA standard nine, when you sell off past performance, you are actually in breach of your obligations. And the reason, not only is it law, but the reason you're in breach, if you like, of your moral obligations is exactly what you were saying, Con. We need to be working on being the mental coach and how we get people through those lower returns and this changing dynamic that's going on all the time, as opposed to talking about what last year's race was, we might as well be talking about the results at the 1964 Olympics. They were both in Tokyo, very interesting, but irrelevant. Um, I'll use this example. 
you're on the freeway. You've got autopilot on or cruise control and you've got this new adaptive cruise control. And because you've been on the freeway now for like five years and it's a straight road or three hours, you think, oh, good, I can sit on 120, have my feet off and, and fine. What I'm saying is we're starting to hit some bends and really bad weather. Yep. And so past performance being that freeway for three hours is not going to cut it. You are coming up to storm, clouds are coming, the storms are there and the road's going to get windy. Yep. Don't go on autopilot. And autopilot. you've got to- and you've got to be out Look there out the manage- front window, not the back. The back window is the past. It's useless. Look out the front window. The front window is the conditions are changing. And my last one is, and uh, you and I like uh, batting backwards and forwards, you know, strategic sort of things is, and you may, uh, you may know, have no view. Um, but I think that the inevitable internal debate that's going on in government about strategic assets, um, Port of Newcastle, particularly Port of Darwin. Um, I personally have the view that um, the Navy uh, should build themselves a purpose-built port at uh, Darwin and move on. But the internal debate about Darwin, if the government makes a decision that says, we want the port back, that seriously clouds our ability, our sovereign risk position. Um, and it may be the, uh, the, lessors or, or the lessors of the port don't want to be involved in it. I don't know. I have no insight whatsoever. But when you see the debate going on, what people are not thinking about is we are a net importer of capital. And to say to someone, we entered into an agreement with you for 99 year leases, but you can now clear off. Um, that has a significant capital, uh, a, a, a significant capital cost, in my view. So the that gets back to geopolitical. So there are some difficult waters to navigate between on South China Sea and the geopolitical print between the, the Five Eyes and 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 the rest. Um, Afghanistan this week, I think, is the start of, unfortunately, some destabilisation in the region. And um, there'll be some difficult decisions that the government will have to make on strategic assets. And you're right, the, the, the capital provider could be China, but the other capital providers what could be the Middle East or Europe or the US or super funds bringing money back home. I mean, there's gonna be some decisions made on strategic cities, strategic investments, strategic ports, strategic fuel reserves. That's been happening around the world. We do it anyway in Australia. We're just gonna see it more front and center. The benign scenarios, we have more of this going for the next four or five years. I just think the rhetoric and the blood pressure of this is going to go up in the next couple of years and at times will dominate our thinking. As, as was put to me by a person who knows far more about the Middle East than me, as it related to Afghanistan, they said, and, and they come from that part of the world as well, they said, you need to understand that the Americans have hit a position where they have a couple of options. They can continue continue to battle in a place that doesn't want to fight for itself or they can leave it in the hands of people who may become irrational that border Iran and China. What do you what what do you think they were thinking? Yeah, yeah. there's India, there's Iraq, Iran, China. That area, as I said to you, then then comes down to Korea, and then there's Japan. And then there's Taiwan, then there's Hong Kong, right? You come down right through and then up to Singapore. There's a lot of big questions. And that's why just having a couple of shares in China or in Asia and saying that's your portfolio, be careful, be diversified. If you're going to allocate to emerging markets, have a broadly diversified portfolio, have it as a, as a portion of your overall global. Don't let that dominate because, you know, as I said, these things are going to get they're going to get hairy in the next four or five years 
I think they're manageable. It just means you just have to be alive to the fact that, you know, you're in more volatile times politically and financially. Yeah, I agree. All right, Con, um, well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And, I mean, let's um, end on a good note. I think the fiscal stimulus and the low rates and the fact that we'll get through with vaccines does mean we get out of this. It's just going to test our patience, that's all. No, great. Absolutely. But we, we will get out of it. It's just not going to be uh, simple uh, nor straightforward. But, and um, what I say to our friends in the Eastern States, it's going to pass, but unfortunately it's going to pass like a kidney stone. <laughs> all right, mate. Thank, Thank you. you. All Spoke soon. See you later. Thanks. Bye, mate.